Welcome, fellow dungeon crawlers, to the dreary eerie. Today, we're blasting off into the future on a Repcon rocket and taking a look at Fallout PNP. Get your Pip Boy radio tuned and keep your Nuka Cola cold as we're going in for a nuclear blast. Which, if you think about it, would probably kill us. It's also the name of a good record label. Let's begin! Mm <clears> hmm. <throat> Let's start at the beginning. For those who have stayed away from role-playing on computers and consoles, allow me to introduce you to the world of Fallout. After the end of the Second World War, the world of Fallout diverges from our own. In the 1950s, the U.S. government puts its mind towards the mastery of the atom, absolute control of nuclear power. With this comes a host of nuclear-powered wonders, nuclear cars, robots, and the invention of laser and teleforce weaponry. At the same time, China quickly rises to the dominant communist power of the world, surpassing the Soviet Union. In this nuclear world, the Cold War progresses far faster than in our own, and by 2077, China has invaded Anchorage, Alaska, the U.S. has annexed Canada, and Europe is in tatters. Oil has run out, and the precious natural resources are fought over by the remaining world powers. Then one day, on October 23rd, 2077, the nuclear powers all damned the Earth to mutual destruction. The United States, China, the USSR, Europe, and everywhere else ceased to be. Or so it seemed. In the years after the war, human survivors began to pop up around the wastelands, and some people preserved in underground vaults came to the surface as well. These survivors strive to rebuild the civilization of before, or simply try to eke out a living through agriculture, trade, or brutal raiding. The wasteland is an unforgiving place. It is barren, devoid of most plant life, and danger is all around. Irradiated monsters, made massive or given mutations by radiation, stock the land. Worst still are the mutants created by the mysterious FEV. And then there are psychopaths as well, ready to kill a man for a new pair of pants. For those of you who's played, who have played DayZ before, this is not new. This is, in a simplest sense, Fallout, a post-apocalyptic role-playing game. Thrust into a hostile world of raiders and ray guns, coded in Americana, groups of survivors adventure through the wastes of the post-apocalyptic United States, or beyond. Fallout PNP is the realization of a dream long held by many Fallout fans. A multiplayer and truly open Fallout experience you can play with your friends. Many Fallout fans are tabletop gamers, and this is the closest we've ever gotten to an official tabletop Fallout. So how does the game hold up? First off, I'd like to say that for quite some time, uh, if for the course of a few months in my role-playing group, Fallout PNP actually usurped Dungeons & Dragons uh, as the favorite game. I essentially, in my group, we generally only have time for Dungeons & Dragons, especially now uh, with everyone being incredibly preoccupied. Occasionally, I was able to eke in a Call of Cthulhu session here and there, but back in the golden days, when we had more time on our hands, we would play... Dungeons and & Dragons, and for a while we had Fallout P&P going as a rather good offshoot game. And oddly enough, even though we had all these other games to choose from, like Shadowrun and Call of Cthulhu, uh, Fallout P&P ended up being the secondary game. And there's a good reason for this, mostly being that me and everyone I know are just massive Fallout fans, and really did enjoy the series to such a great extent that if we could find anything Fallout related to play, we would. Now, we played with the original system, the one I'm, I'm reviewing now, uh, Mikal's 2.0, the only real Fallout system, uh, and we tried out Exodus for a little bit. Exodus is essentially a, uh, uh, a, a Fallout D20 that fell through, so the creators had to finish it while changing all of the names and everything to make it not be Fallout even though it was basically Fallout, and uh, we didn't care much for Exodus. We felt it was too Dungeons and Dragons and not enough Fallout in it. Uh, so, before I go into this, I will state that I do love the Mikal system, uh, of the system that he invented, uh, and more so that we played it for quite some time uh, with our, uh, our role-playing group. Uh, so, yes, I do think it's rather good. And if you want to make a, a game, like... A, if you want to run a game 
in the Macal setting, in the in the Macal system, then by all means do so, because I do wholeheartedly support it. But anyways, back to the overview. Firstly, the game is old. PNP was made when the last Fallout game was Fallout Tactics. Its system reflects the special of long lost times before Bethesda ever touched Fallout. That said, the system used in the Fallout games was initially inspired by the tabletop GURPS system, so with Macau's alterations, PNP is a more than serviceable system for the tabletop. If you're a fan of Call of Cthulhu, there's a bit of crossover in Fallout PNP in that it uses percentiles. It is a somewhat more complicated percentile system involving D10s, with more modifiers than one may be used to. Everything here is based on percentages and generally rolling under them, as with Call of Cthulhu. If you're used to percentile systems, great, but I'll keep out the numbers for now because I want to keep this as uh, more of an overview. Though, if anyone wants me to get more specific, I, I would gladly do so. But the book's out there by itself, and I feel like it would be better spent you just looking at it than me explaining it. Because, well, this video is boring enough. So let's start with character creation. Character creation does use the special system, and it works just as it did in Fallouts 1 and 2. Uh, not many people have played those ones anymore, but, uh, well, if you do, you know exactly what to expect. The first step is in choosing traits, the typical boon and weakness found in most of the fallouts, and then your race. Unlike all fallout games, with the exclusion of tactics, this game allows you to play multiple different races. A player can be a human, ghoul, super mutant, a so-called half-mutant... Uh, and then the really weird ones. Dogs, Death Claws, and Robots. The Half Mutant is a blatant betrayal of Fallout canon, so I choose not to accept it in my games. For most groups, you'll want to limit the party to the first three races, because Dogs, Robots, and especially Death Claws are very difficult to roleplay. Funnily enough, the old games imply that wearing a big cloak is enough for a Death Claw to pass as a human, so feel free to incorporate that logic into your game. Perhaps one could even make a campaign out of outcasts, but ha having a player that did play a dog before, it doesn't really work out that well, especially when you have one player that's a dog and one that's a robot. We thought we could handle it, what can I say? It's at least refreshing to get the option to be a different race, and race has an appreciable effect on the character. Super mutants are durable and rad resistant, and the ghouls are practically immune to radiation. They pay for these in different stat caps and the obvious social stigma which could cost them their life if the DM is mean. Hit points are calculated using strength and endurance or an increase during leveling. The game is still brutal, but not as harsh as the Fallout CRPGs. If you reach zero or negative hit points in the CRPGs, you die, sometimes rather spectacularly. Big holes blown through your chest. Sometimes you're just blasted in half. It's a fun game. Fun games. But here you get a whole negative five hit points before you die. Armor class exists and acts much as it did in other RPGs. Armor class is a direct deduction from chance to hit, which is pretty fair. Uh, that's kind of similar to... Well, okay, in Dungeons & Dragons, your opponent has to roll over your armor class to hit you. Uh, in Fallout PNP, it simply lowers their chance overall. For example, if an opponent has a... 50% chance to hit you, and your armor class is 11, well, now they only have a 39% chance, so it's like a... It, essentially what it is is that you subtract your armor class from the number that they have to roll at or under to hit you. So, they used to have to roll at or under 50, now they have to roll at or under 39. So armor class is very important in this game. Now, that being said, one could say that armor class then is almost too good but you'll find that in Fallout, that's kind of altered by the fact that when you get to higher levels, enemies' uh, chance to hit, base chance to hit, does not actually... Uh, it is not actually at 100%. This is an interesting thing about the old Fallouts. Your skills can go well over 100%, up to 200%, in fact. Uh, one might question the usefulness of it, but if someone's got a really high armor class, that could be useful. So, this game uses action points in much the same way the first two games did. So, if you are only familiar with the Bethesda ones, this will be new to you. The action points essentially govern how many actions you can perform in your turn. If you're familiar with the old Fallouts, 
this, well, should come obviously. Even some features more associated with new Fallout, such as weapon condition, are being used in this game. Uh, so keep it light on the system description, but basically, if you know the old Fallouts, you'll be well at home. If you only know the new Fallouts, you'll have a lot of learning to do. Combat rules cover everything you could need, and I compliment the game book on its compact size here. It's only about 160 pages. It's mostly because they didn't have to waste time establishing setting, though they kind of do put in quite a few setting details. It's most likely if you're playing it, you know what Fallout is already. Also, you don't have to establish pantheons of gods or extra alphabets or anything like that like you would in, you'd have to in D&D. But yeah, combat rules, pretty serviceable. Uh, I'm sure there's a few things missing, but this isn't like aces and eights where every minute detail must be covered. And in all honesty, it's more actually uh, descriptive than, say, some versions of Dungeons & Dragons. The character with the highest perception tends to go first, as opposed to, say, the highest agility, which this is true with many games, uh, but agility still returns here as the god stat. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the, in the first two fallouts, you really needed high agility, like agility was absolutely necessary in order to run combat even reasonably well. So it returns as the god stat because it determines how many action points you get. Any character doing any amount of fighting is going to need high agility. Now you can be a non-combatant kind of character, but you're better off just staying out of the fight if that's the case. You use action points to move, to fire, to reload, to access your inventory. All actions cost a certain amount of AP, and generally the rules are pretty decent as to how you go about it. It's a functional system, but I feel like modern Fallout fans will be less fond of it than the old school fans. I know for me, when I was playing this game, I got a big rush of nostalgia because of my experience with Fallout 1 and Fallout 2. Then, uh, just a small gripe, when we get into weapon condition, I'll probably just uh, be pointing the... I'm just pointing this out in kind of chronological order, uh, some points that I find uh, interesting. The problem with the condition system is that it lacks nuance. The fact that a weapon loses condition if it misses a hit is a bit dumb, and you could probably house rule it to be a more reasonable system based on usage. I'm of the opinion that actually if a weapon hits its target, it's more likely to... Uh, get it's more likely to get uh broken or something like that so i think you have to kind of just uh now i know that it recently like with fallout 4 they basically got rid of uh condition in general which i myself wasn't all that fond of but i think you could simply make a good number as to when you think a weapon's going to break and keep the counting from there as opposed to the idea that if it misses a hit it starts to get bad condition uh it doesn't make much sense. It's one of the few gripes I have with the system. Uh, there's the concept of targeted shots. They return. They work exactly like they do in the old fallouts. Uh, now, there's rules in this game. That, this is probably one of the more unique things in this game, is the rule for using vehicles. Unlike in all the fallouts with the exclusion of two, where you actually got the highwayman, you can have a vehicle, very useful for passing through the great expanses of the wasteland. So if you're playing in, like, a big deserted area, like, anywhere in Canada that is not Ontario, uh, a car will serve you well. There are rules for combat, weather effects, ramming, etc. But my favorite has to be the calculation of crash, da crash damage, likely to kill the fuck out of most player characters. Basically, based on the speed that you're going, you roll a certain amount of d10s, and, well, if you get a shit roll, you roll really high, well, then you're going to die. It's brutal and effective. Even if you survive the massive damage, you're likely to be easily crippled. So, this game is not pulling any punches. I like that. Uh, sometimes it's freaking brutal in Fallout. Now, obviously in the game's Fallout has some great stuff like Stimpaks and Super Stimpaks and, like, Doctor's Kits. But... The fact that a car crash can very easily kill you outright is, uh, realistic. It's like why, uh, death claws should just insta-kill you. Rules for fire and acid are normal, you know. However long you stay in them, you take more damage. They do damage per turn. But different forms of na- uh, Yes. Different forms of nastiness <coughs> exist with these, and poison can be really bad if used properly. There are many poisons, but the last two- the F and G ranks are the worst. They can both, co both cause death, one after comma and the other after mere minutes. 
Yes, that's right. Fallout has the kill you kind of poison cyberpunk is known for. A return to the squirt gun wars indeed. Uh, none of my players ever knew the rules well enough uh, to use that against me, though I'm sure they would have tried to. Radiation exists, but much like in Fallout 1 and Fallout 2, and let's face it, every other Fallout, perhaps with the exception of Fallout 4, it's negligible. It's dangerous, debilitating, slow to lose, and eventually deadly, but you can probably just stay out of it. What Fallout P&P makes uh, it more dangerous with is the fact that this is indeed a role-playing game that's controlled by a game master, so a game master can choose how prevalent radiation is, and in this game, given that you only lose a few rads every 24 hours that you filter out, which honestly is generous, it can lead to a lot of problems with radiation. You need to pack rad X, rad away, get yourself some hazmat suits and some Geiger counters, because I can actually see radiation being far deadlier in this than it ever was in any of the other fallouts. Speaking of things that are dangerous for you, uh, chems and drugs have a greater impact than computer games as well. Going through withdrawal will cause you to lose stats, be incapacitated, and eventual success in going through withdrawal will actually cause you to lose an endurance point. So, just like in real life, it's better to stay away from the stuff in general. But if you're going to use them, paradoxically, the best thing to do is to just never run out. All right. Uh, I figure I'll talk a bit about the level advancement here. If you're a Fallout fan, you'll be happy with this. Or maybe you won't. I don't know. I don't know who you are. But levels go up to 22 normally, much like the old Fallout's limited leveling. And skills can progress up to 200%, because it's twice as good as any normal RPG. With skills costing more to upgrade the higher up they are. For example... In a certain range, it'll cost one, then after that it'll cost two, then three, then once you're in the hundreds, at like the hundred and fifties, it's going to cost you like four skill points to upgrade a skill by one point. This encourages players to more evenly distribute their skill points and not go for a heavily specialized build, because it will actually hurt you. Unless, of course, you've got your tag... Obviously, you can focus on your tag skills still. Yes, tag skills return, and for those of you who've only played the new Fallouts, tag skills here work more like they did in the old game, where it's a bit of a bonus, but what's most important about your tag skills is the idea that they will level up faster, whereas there is no such concept in the new Fallouts, uh, specifically not in the weirdness that is Fallout 4, where they've basically just done away with the whole system anyways. Much like the old Fallouts, perks come every three levels to humans, and less often to other races such as Super Mutants and Death Claws. Level and stat requirements exist for all of them, and many can be recognized from the games. Like the old Fallouts, you choose uh, your perks wisely, because they are far less numerous than skill points. Some newer ones are pretty interesting, and they're even Death Claw, Robots, Super Mutant, and Ghoul perks. I personally like the poisonous claws that Death Claws seem to be able to just grow. Much like in all Fallouts, some are great and others are worthless. For example, Team Player gives a plus 10% to all skills when friends are near, but Pack Rat is kind of worthless in this game's incarnation, where you already have Strong Back, <clears throat> which, in, which functionally is just a better version. Overall, the perks and traits and skill building are probably the most unique and interesting draws to the game in comparison to others. They are uniquely Fallout and you can't find them elsewhere. Now for my... The, uh, now for my... <clears throat> now for my segment that I love the most, because it's the one I'm actually the most knowledgeable about, we're going to talk about the Fallout canon. We come to this, and it is the weakest point of the 2.0 book. Adherence to the modern Fallout canon. For this, I cannot fault it, as besides the inclusion of half-mutants... Fucking half-mutants. Jesus Christ. The info it contains is accurate up to the latest Bethesda-era games. <coughs> I think I got some radiation poisoning going on. Ugh. Unfortunately, the Bethesda games, uh, those published by Bethesda and those directly made by Bethesda Game Studios, are far larger than the previous games and added large swaths of canon, primarily on the East Coast. This isn't actually 
bad, but New Vegas specifically develops the canon about Nevada that was so blurry in the old games, where Tycho can basically tell you it's a nuclear hellhole and no one questioned him, but then we find out Tycho's a lying son of a bitch. We know what Vegas was like now, whereas before it was merely hinted at. So the section about Vegas being a nuclear waste are rather humorous, given we now know that it was the exact opposite, and any ideas about Arizona are also invalid, since now we have Caesar's Legion. That said, since this is a game for Fallout fans, a GM can likely fill the void with their own extensive knowledge of the canon. As a group from Canada, we have focused partly on regions out of the established canon, uh, like, for example, the coast of British Columbia or Ontario. Overall, the only problem with the canon section is that we need a PNP third, which thankfully enough is in the works. Now, for the creatures, the bestiary section is only very basic and covers just a few creatures of the waste. Since this is a fan-made piece, I can't expect much more, but sticking to the book will have you running out of animals quickly. The GM who too long coasted on the well-stocked bestiaries of D&D or Call of Cthulhu will be in new territory, having to make creatures from scratch. I'm personally not new to this, as I made new creatures for D&D back in the impoverished days before we had a monster manual. They fought a lot of wolves back in those days. But I can assure you that making a monster for PNP is no more difficult than making one for Dungeons & Dragons, and if you're fine with ripping them right from the games, you shall be fine. Fog crawlers in California may not be advisable, though, unless you plan to make a road trip comedy. I could see that, just like a band coming down from, like, Massachusetts or elsewhere, coming down from uh, Maine with their fog crawlers in their, uh, in the... I, I don't think fog crawlers would do well, considering they can barely live outside of the fog. They probably wouldn't do so well in the Mojave. That being said, that's what they said about Death Claws, and look where they are. Everywhere. Now, weapons and armor. This RPG is no slouch when it comes to equipment. Just like in the computer games, you'll find a myriad of weapons, armors, and equipment, as well as different ammo types and weapon mods. Classic weapons like the Power Fist, Super Sledge, Laser Rifle, Hunting Rifle, and the most beloved Pipe Rifle come back. Because this is based on the old Fallouts, new favorites like the Shish Kebab do not appear, but many weapons from Fallout Tactics, as well as others like the... 007-style Walther PPK and the World War II Sten Gun are pretty great having around, especially since the Bethesda Fallouts have a sad tendency to make generic weapon names. I mean, I couldn't have been the only person that was really, really weirded out by Fallout 3 with its 10mm submachine gun, and then New Vegas just has 9mm submachine gun. Yes, I know that they generally didn't want to brand any official weapons, because that costs money, but, uh... To the tabletop RPG is not working for money and therefore has no such problems. Ammunition runs the range from BBs and darts to the 50 cal depleted uranium round. Poison needles, missiles, everything else you could put in a Fallout game. There's even sections for weaponized acid and toxic gases, ideas not explored in the Fallout series as of yet. Not only are there a menagerie of weapons, but it's easy to make new ones, and there are already new rules for the 3.0 version. That being said, one questions the, uh, the post-apocalyptic morality of the players ever getting their hands on mustard gas, but I'm sure some, uh, villainous forces could get a hold of it. As for armor, I don't have much to say. It's varied, and it includes special armor for ghouls and mutants. Beyond that, inventory items are as expected. What is interesting about the armor system here is there's different types of resistances to laser, to physical damage, to ballistics, to explosives. And this is quite important, because some armors will do more to protect you than others. Leather armor, for example, will protect you a little bit from bullets, but you'll get cut through easily by lasers. Whereas power armor... Well, power armor is basically... What you have to remember is that in the old fallouts, power armor was like the creme de la creme. And in the end, you were going to get screwed over by laser weapons and... Uh, things like that anyways. Generally, the idea was that late in the game, big guns and energy weapons would just carry you. It's it back before these days, where now everyone's got a super uber-powered ballistic weapon. No, no, no. Back in the old Fallout days, you needed to get yourself a laser. But anyways, that's all I have to say about armor, is that there are some interesting new, uh, different concepts of damage calculation that you'll probably find interesting. Uh, there's also damage threshold and damage resistance, both being used in tandem. 
Damage resistance will affect how much damage uh, you take in the end. Damage threshold will actually straight up absorb damage for you, whereas damage resistance will basically determine the percentage of the remaining damage after damage threshold that you take. It might be somewhat complicated, but it makes for a good system. Then we come back to the vehicles, chronologically last in this book. The game stats numerous vehicles you can ride through the wastes and follow the unique and functional vehicle management rules, where each segment of the vehicle is divided up and has its own hit points, essentially. These vehicles act as more of a guideline on the type of car, but of course included is the Corvega Highwayman, the only car to actually be used in the Fallout series. The book goes through all your major vehicles, including the tantalizing idea of armored cars and tanks, including an Abrams, and mobile artillery. Surely there will be a game where the party gets a howitzer. I did give my party an old beat-up sedan, and even this is leagues above what the Wastelanders have. Truly, the freedom of a vehicle is magnified in the Fallout world, so I highly recommend getting a car while you're playing. Of course, a plane or a vertebrate may be preferred. After the vehicles, we make our way to the appendices, sample characters, and a sample adventure. Rather well written, I may add, and this is a good guideline for what a GM should expect out of a Fallout adventure. Overall, this game is simply the best system out there for playing Fallout on tabletop, short of creating one yourself, and too few people know of its existence. Jason Mickle built this system to fill a void that very much needed to be filled. It's not as though there aren't a lot of post-apocalyptic games, or even retro-futuristic games, but there isn't a Fallout game for tabletop, not before this one. Rather than adopt the D20 system, Mickle developed a more authentic system for Fallout on tabletop. With it, we can do things we can't in the Fallout games on computer. We can play with friends, drive a tank through the desert, and have truly open-ended experiences. Though the system has faults here and there, and is perhaps more complicated than some may like, this was made and distributed freely, and is better than it would have any right to be. Better yet, there's a new version being made. Mickle's 3.0 now takes into account additions to the Fallout canon, with a focus on the west coast of the United States. It can easily be used to supplement the old version, though it has yet to be published. The verdict? There's no better Fallout RPG on the market or off it. It's free, it's great, it's one of the best RPG experiences I and my friends have ever had.